Welcome to Strange Familiars. If you've seen something strange or paranormal, a cryptid like Bigfoot, a ghost, UFOs, or if you know of a story you think we should cover, you can email us, strangefamiliarspodcast at gmail.com. So we got an early release of the podcast this week because the rest of my week is going to be pretty busy. Chad and I are working on a very special Strange Familiars. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, a clip show. <laughs> no, no it's, it's not a clip show. Not even close. It's going to be an all-new show. But Can we please do a clip show with one of those like doo-doo, 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 things where we go back in time and say, remember when this happened? And then we show it, play a clip. I should do a best of at some point. Yeah. But this is not what Chad and I are working on. Oh, okay. No clip shows then. We are working on a real show, which will be in a different format. Let's put it like that. Very, very special episode. And not video either. Don't get excited. Not sure when we'll get it done, but we're going to do some more recording for it this week. We've already done some recording, and uh, we'll see what happens. On tonight's show, we're going to be talking to A.P. Strange, and he's got a bunch of strange stories Mm -hmm. from Massachusetts and surrounding states, including a terror reading by a ghost. Really, really interesting story he leads off with. Some really strange lights he saw in his bedroom as a kid, poltergeist activity. And another callback to Athol, Massachusetts. Keeps we, coming up. I know. It just sounds like you say another word with a speech impediment. <laughs> <laughs> we can't get away from Athol. <laughs> <laughs> I do think uh, we need to make a Strange Familiars trip to Athol. I think it's it's come up in the show enough. Where I know. I miss to... it. I really like that area is so beautiful. Western Massachusetts. It's yeah. just one of the, the most beautiful places in it. I guess some people don't consider that Western Mass. It's not far enough west in Massachusetts for them to oh, consider okay. Western Oh, okay. Yeah, I know. That's like th- those are regional yeah. delineations. Yeah. Like, I never understood why upstate New York just basically means not New York City, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> it's not really like New York's pretty big, but. Well, let's go ahead and hear my talk with Mr. A.P. Strange. Okay, tonight we're talking with Mr. A.P. Strange about some experiences he's had throughout his life. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing well, Tim. How are you? Doing pretty good. So how did you want to start this? Did you want to go chronologically? I know you said you, you had a few things to do with hauntings, and was it a tarot reading by a ghost? Oh, yeah. Tarot reading by a ghost is a good story. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we, could, would, we could start there. That... Whatever order you want to tell them. Yeah, I haven't really had much of a chance to tell that one. I did put this on on the uh, Liminal Earth map for uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, which is where I'm from. This happened in about 2001 or thereabouts because it was around the time I graduated high school. So I know that much. And I know it was in late June when it happened. So I was at a bookstore with one of my friends and we were there because the bookstore had a little restaurant inside of it. And we would often just go there just to get coffee and some pastries and then look at some books. But we got there kind of later than we wanted to. So as we approached the place, there was a there was a woman outside with a whole bunch of shopping bags. And um, she, had, she was talking to some kid and he looked a little nervous, you know, and uh, like he didn't want to be talking to her. And as we approached, she turned and looked at me. And she had these uh, these eyes that just kind of were cloudy. Like, you could swear she was blind. Mm-hmm. Looked right at me and asked if she could if she could have a cigarette. And I, I just, you know, without thinking about it, just pulled my pack out and gave her one. And then I went inside, and it kind of struck me a little bit. It was a little weird that she asked for one because I wasn't smoking when I walked up, so I didn't know how she knew I would have one or anything like that. But I kind of brushed it off. And like I said, we got there a little bit later than we normally ever would. And the ca- the whole cafe restaurant area was closing up. 
So we didn't want to really waste anybody's time by ordering a cup of coffee and hanging out while they're closing up. So we decided not to get coffee and we left. And we got back outside and she's still there. So when she had uh, when she had bummed the cigarette originally, she just kind of she had mentioned that she lost her pack of cigarettes. And at this point now she's got a whole bunch of bags all over the ground. And she's saying, you know, I lost my pack of cigarettes. Doesn't that just get you? I just bought them. And like tons of bags from Walgreens, like way more than the amount that you would think a woman her size would be able to carry walking down the street. She, she stopped me again and said, I hate to bother you, but would you mind giving me a ride down the street to Walgreens? I need to buy another pack of cigarettes because I lost them. She, she's really distraught about this. And she says, you know, I got hit by a car a couple months ago. And uh, my doctor told me that walking is good for me as like physical therapy. So I try to do it, but I'm just tired now because I already walked all the way here, you know. Now, so I mean, this woman, is, she kind of had like the like the archetypal kind of crone look to her, like very, you know, <laughs> very frail looking. And she had about 13 or 14 bags full of stuff from from the store. I couldn't imagine how she even walked that far carrying all the stuff. But of course, I, I was going to help her out because, you know, who would say no to a nice little old lady? So she brought all the shopping bags over to my little car and, and put them inside. And it was a little, like, Mustang convertible, uh, one of those 80s ones with, like, a four-cylinder engine that's really tiny. So <laughs> we had to pile all the stuff in. And I started giving her a ride back. She said, you two are musicians, and I said, well, I, yeah, that's true. We, you know, we play music together. And I'm like, how'd you know that? And she goes, oh, well, I've, I've been known to know things. And I said, what do you mean? Like you're psychic? And she goes, yeah, well, you know, um, I can read your fortune if you like. So, of course, I have to take her up on this. Of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, like, uh, given the circumstances, you have to follow this through. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. So I I pulled up to the Walgreens and we kind of pulled up to the end of the parking lot near the street lamp so that we'd have some light coming down through the windshield. I'm not sure if if you or people listening would be familiar with the kind of car I described, but I mean, those cars were really small, like a little Mustang, like the smaller version of the Mustang convertible back in the 80s. You know, <laughs> there wasn't really room to do a tarot reading in there, uh, but she managed it. So she produced an honest-to-goodness crystal ball from her bag. Wow. Yeah, right. I mean, that's not something I've ever really seen. Just an actual crystal ball, a big handkerchief, and her tarot cards. And has me shuffle them up. She does the spread. Now, I can't remember most of the details of, of what she told me during the reading. But I, I know that a lot of it was kind of hitting home for me. And uh, my buddy in the back is of the more skeptical type and he just kind of sat quietly and didn't really say anything. One thing she kept coming back to though was a blonde woman in my life. Like a, a female person that was very important to me that was blonde. And I was trying to think of who she could be talking about because I had a girlfriend. My high school girlfriend was uh she was very Mediterranean, like Greek and Egyptian. She had dark, dark hair, olive skin, you know. <laughs> definitely not a blonde mm -hmm. so she kept talking about a blonde woman and in, in the sense of somebody i'm very affectionate toward i didn't get the feeling that she was bogus and way off course i got the feeling that she knew something i didn't know right mm -hmm. so you can imagine how how a teenage person would feel in, in that situation like who's this other woman <laughs> right so and she, she talked a little bit about music and a little bit about the rest of the summer and um I was I was really disturbed by by this this one thing that she kept saying that you know most people would just shake off as being inaccurate. I thanked her for the reading and as she was getting out of the car one of the bags that she had was full of cherries and she asked me if I wanted one and so I took one and I'm sitting there eating a cherry as she picks up her bags and starts walking away. My buddy has to get out of the back to get into the car because it's a two door and get into the driver's seat and I'm sitting there going, man, man, that was wild. Like, what was she talking about? And he's not paying attention to me because he's kind of like leaning back and looking out the side of the car. I, you know, I could sense he's not listening to me. So I kind of try to <laughs> try to get his attention. And I said, what are you looking at? And he goes, did you see where she went? And I, I, I said, no. And, and uh, 
it didn't it didn't really occur to me that I figured she walked off, right? And I said, well, maybe she went in the store. But like I said, we parked at the far end of the parking lot. So it was a significant walk over to the front door to the store. And he, he goes, you know, she walked awfully fast for a little old lady carrying a whole bunch of bags, you know? Mm-hmm. So it, from from what I remember, it was like she I took the cherry from her and looked at her. She bent down to pick up the bags, and that was the last I ever saw. And when he got into the front seat and looked out, she was nowhere to be seen. <laughs> so oh, <wow. laughs> this woman just basically disappeared. She said her name was Clara. She said she had been hit by a car, and uh, she gave me a tarot reading. <laughs> Huh. <laughs> All very strange. Clara, did you say? Yep, Clara. Last name her. Voyant. Oh, that would be that would be just too good. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't uh, get did a anything ever come of this blonde woman she was talking about? Um, well, th- this is how I know it was late June because I was afraid to talk to my girlfriend after that. And being high school kids, it's not like I saw her like every day. And her mm-hmm. parents were kind of strict, but we would talk on the phone <laughs> kind of often. And um, I didn't really talk to her. I kind of avoided talking to her until the 4th of July cookout at my buddy's house. And she showed up and she had uh, bleached her hair blonde. Oh, wow. <laughs> Just like I didn't know she was going to do that. <laughs> oh, wow. But she showed up with blonde hair and I was like, what the hell? <laughs> Oh wow! <laughs> Too weird. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of the capstone on that story. But so this woman, you know, she appeared outside of this place that you went regularly. Yep. And you never saw her again. No, I never did. Yeah, it was. I saw her there that one night. the The eyes were it really struck me is her eyes looked almost like they were covered with cataracts. You know, mm-hmm. like she shouldn't have been able to see at all. Right, right. Let alone seeing the tarot cards in wow. in a in a car like that. And yeah, I yeah. There were so many little things that didn't add up to me after that. Mm-hmm. Like um they don't sell fresh produce at Walgreens, so I don't know where the cherries came from. <laughs> 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 Just a lot of odd little details like that. And and the fact that my buddy that was more skeptical was the one that picked up on the fact that she just vanished, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was just a, just a lot of odd items attached to that one little thing. <laughs> Do you remember anything particular about the cherry itself? Like, did it taste particularly sweet? Yeah, I think it did. I think I've always had a taste for cherries ever since then. <laughs> interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, if I go to a bar now, I like a cocktail that has a cherry in it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess that's that story. I did eventually find someone else told me a pretty strange story about that same store. Oddly enough, also involving a tarot deck. And that store is also where I bought my first tarot deck. So, yeah, something about that place. It's no longer a bookstore, but it's a it's a different cafe now. Some tarot synchronicity there. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, my friend had told me he went in there and picked up a, um, a Thoth deck, the Crowley deck. Mm-hmm. And um, so they had like a retail area that was all new agey stuff separate from the rest of the store. And he brought it to the counter in that section. And the guy at the counter told him, you can pay for that at the front desk if you want to continue shopping. And my friend, I guess, walked up and just left the store and (laughs) just bypassed the front counter without even thinking about it. The alarm went off because he didn't, uh, didn't pay for it. And he went back to the register. And the cashier called him over, and the guy just took the tag off and sent him on his way. And he left the store with a free deck. <laughs> and, it, and then he, he didn't mean to steal it. He never even thought about it. It was like something came over him and just had him walk out of the store. Right. And he got spooked by that and brought it back in and fessed up and just left the deck there and didn't buy it. Oh, wow. <laughs> He's just like, I'll take this. I don't want it. <laughs> so, Yeah, maybe um, not the best way to start off uh, uh, with the terror deck. Right, right. Stolen decks, that's probably some bad mojo. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, something in one of your recent episodes reminded me of this. I want to just take a second to say I really enjoy your podcast. Every time I listen to it, I feel like I I remember something different and want to just jump in on the conversation (laughs) because you have such a great great outlook on all these things. Oh, well, thank you. And and I really enjoy the the Allison episodes, too. The the Circus History one was great. Thanks so much. Yeah, I really like those. So... Uh, this one I, I kind of mentioned because 
it's a story that my mother tells me that I don't have a conscious memory of, but when I was when I was very young and my brother my brother had yet to be born, my mom was very pregnant. She went grocery shopping one day and <laughs> she got this overwhelming urge to turn around and go see her grandmother, my great grandma Rose. And it would have been it was kind of a real pain because She's very pregnant. She had just loaded up the car with a lot of groceries uh, that she needed to get home and put away. And she had me, and I was, you know, one and a half, little toddler. And it was just terribly inconvenient to turn around and go to my grandmother, great-grandmother's house before she went home. Mm -hmm. But she felt she really needed to do it, so she did. While I was there, my great-grandmother played with me and talked with her, and they had coffee and everything. And then on the way out the door, my great-grandmother pinned a little bag of salt to my shirt as like a, as a protective thing. Mm-hmm. I guess it's an old Italian tradition. Mm-hmm. And she told my mother, make sure he, he grows up loving God. And my mom thought it was a little strange because my great grandmother didn't necessarily talk that way. You know, it was just kind of out of character for her, but she left and, and that same day she, she had an aneurysm and, and fell into a coma. Oh. So my mom was like one of the last people to see her conscious. And it was kind of a spooky story that I think informed the way I look at the world ever since I was a little kid, because that was something that happened to my mom and me, but I was I was too young to register it. But right, yeah. it was almost like a premonition kind of thing. Like this is your last chance to go hang out with your grandmother, you mm-hmm. know. So that always kind of informed my outlook on things. Sure. Yeah. Well, it would. I would think. Yeah, and I, and I tend to think a lot of this stuff does kind of run in families. Do you find that a lot? Uh, it certainly can. Yeah, yeah. It, it certainly can. I, I don't know if it's if it's always the case, but it's it's certainly often enough the case where uh, it's worth noting. Yeah, I guess you could go chronological from there. Was your great grandmother known for these like sort of uh, folk cures? You know, like the the pinning of the salt and so forth. I, I, gu- I guess she was. I mean, she was just superstitious in the way that a lot of old Italians would. You know, it's like old mm-hmm. country type sort of stuff. Sure, yeah. Protection uh, from the evil eye and all that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah the the Maluk is was a thing. The mm-hmm. the evil eye, the Italian horn that they wore and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like you know, obviously I don't have have any memory of her necessarily, but I always I always felt connected to her through through these stories, you know. Sure, yeah. Yeah. And my grandmother I've always been very close to, so the, the same Italian side of the family. There's always that kind of superstition there. Mm-hmm. Something reminded me of that in one of your recent recent episodes. <laughs> Just I guess the folk folk curiosity part of it. Right. But, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so moving forward from there. Yep. Yeah, okay. Let's go. I wouldn't have been too much older in the next one. Probably about five, five or six. Uh, this one involves a pair of lights at the end of my bed. I bunk beds with with my younger brother, and I kind of woke up a little bit one night, and there were a pair of of bobbing lights at the end of my bed. And now I'm top bunk, so they would have been about four feet off the end of my bed. And I always kind of referred to them as orbs. To my childlike mind, I thought of them as gloves, because they reminded me of like the cartoon gloves that that, that you know cartoon characters like Mickey Mouse or or Bugs Money would have had. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's just kind of how my, my child mind interpreted it. But they were just luminescent, amorphous forms of light. And um, I kind of crawled to the end of the bed, and they started asking me questions. What? Wow. Yeah. So it's just a pair of lights that just seem to kind of talk with one voice and pulsate and just kind of move up and down slowly. They uh, basically asked me a bunch of mundane questions like, what's your name? Like, who are you? <laughs> you know, what are you doing here? You know, so I, and I just answered them. And, and kind of in the way that any kid is trained to being polite to to an authority figure. Mm-hmm. So I gave my full name, full first, <laughs> middle, last. I gave him the full street address where we were. <laughs> you know, I said, like, this is my room. Like, what, you know, what do you mean? What am I doing here? I'm in my room. (laughs) And um, at some point during it, it was almost like they got the impression that they weren't welcome. Right. I sensed like a, like a disappointment with the two entities at the end of the bed and they started to drift towards the window and I didn't want them to go. 
I was about to say something like come back and then I kind of fell back to my pillow and then I could see myself falling back to the pillow and I kind of drifted out the window after him. Oh, wow. So it was kind of like an out-of-body experience there. Mm -hmm. The next thing that I could see was a bunch of balloons and this McDonald's in the center of town where, where I grew up. And there was a birthday party going on. And it was a birthday party for me and my brother. I woke up in the morning remembering the whole thing and thinking about the, um, the McDonald's in the center of town because we didn't have one. The town I grew up in was was smaller, and we didn't have a McDonald's or anything like it. So it was kind of like, it would be great if there was a McDonald's right there in the center of town. <laughs> but there wasn't until a couple of years later. And when I first noticed that they put up the golden arches, I pointed it out to my mother, and she said, yeah, we're planning on having a little birthday party for you and your brother with your friends once they're finished building it. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> and we did. Was it in the, uh, the same location that you dreamed? Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, it was a little. It's a little plaza that's right in the center of the town, and um, yeah, it was exactly where I dreamed it would be. A weird little mind blowing thing for me when I was that was probably by that time seven or eight. So, because <laughs> it was a couple of years after this, mm -hmm. but that's the part that sticks with me through adulthood, though, because just encountering a couple entities at the end of your bed when you're a kid and then falling asleep, you know. Um, falling asleep quite against my will too. It's not like I just rolled over and went to sleep. It was, I was trying to convince these things to hang around right? and then just got very drowsy and fell backwards onto the pillow. But then I could see myself falling backwards. So I wasn't even, you know, it was a weird transition from first person viewpoint to being outside the body. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, um, all of that I could, I could chalk up to being a dream when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. except except for the premonition part of it <laughs> right, <laughs> you know? right so i don't know what you make of any of that but well it's something pretty advanced for a five-year-old to come up with you know that right. the amorphous lights asking questions now when they spoke do you remember anything about the voice unusual or did it just seem like an adult's voice at the time oh yeah no i remember um i don't know how to describe it though it had a kind of a reverby echoey sound to it hmm. it was like something out of a sci-fi you know you know like something you'd hear on star trek maybe mm -hmm. <laughs> like kind of an echoey reverb and it was i got the sense it was both both entities talking with one voice wow you know yeah that's, or, that seems a little or, much for a five-year-old to just make up you know like it, by make up i mean like in their head you know what i mean like like to dream right yeah yeah, and I mean, I always remembered myself being even younger than that, but it's one of those things that you think about the details and you say, well, if I was on a top bunk and my brother was in a bed, you know, I must, you know, mm -hmm. I couldn't have been three because then my brother would have been a baby. I know he's two years younger than me, you know, so it's, so, so I kind of had to adjust how old I must have been, you know, but right. I'm guessing about five. Right. I can't say for certain. Now, did you ever see those lights again? I didn't. It was just like they wandered right out the window. They just kind of wafted toward the window, and the window wasn't open. They just seemed to pass through it, and, mm -hmm. and that was I didn't see them again. Huh. But I seemed to follow them in the out of body state, in a way. You know? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as I was outside the house, it was just kind of like a flash of light, and then balloons and the McDonald's. You know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, I never encountered those again. But that room that was our bedroom when we were kids, as I grew up, that be, kind of became known as the spare room in the house. Uh, it was like a guest bedroom that nobody ever stayed in. And it was a really kind of inconveniently placed between my parents' bedroom and, and what became me and my brother's bedroom. So um, it just was, was, was an unused room that nobody was ever in. But it was... It was creepy for that reason, and when the poltergeist activity started kicking up later on, that that seemed like ground zero for it, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a scary, <laughs> a scary room that we wanted to avoid afterward. Oh, okay. And then much later than that, it became my brother's bedroom, and he saw lots of weird stuff in there when we were like teenagers. Interesting. So. 
Very yeah. interesting. Well, you can't tease us with the poltergeist stuff and not follow through. Oh, no, I can't. <laughs> um, I, I should also mention the house was built in 1779, so it was very old. Um, and where is this? Just as, You don't have to be super specific, but just... You know, well, it's in Massachusetts. It's 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 in West Boston, Massachusetts. I can say that much. Okay. There's a there's a couple of properties there that are about that old, but mm-hmm. that's the town I grew up in. But a large colonial house. Uh, it was built by somebody that came back from fighting in the Revolutionary War. So, <laughs> uh, had some history. Yeah, it did. Yeah. And I, I was a historical commissioner in town later on, and I got to dig into some of the history of the house. Oh, that's um, super cool. Yeah, nothing particularly crazy that I knew learned about. You know, like nobody was ever murdered there or anything. But, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I, I don't I don't put too much stock in. You know, something something traumatic had to have happened there for it to be to be kind of a liminal space. You oh know? yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely correct in that. I, no guarantees. Right. Yeah. Right. It's nothing so obvious anyway. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, the the poltergeist activity started with that room. It was it was a room that, like I said, nobody ever went in there. But at some point, the door to the room started opening. It would just fly open, and nobody would be on the other side. And it happened often enough that my mother got sick of us getting scared and went over and attached like uh, one of those hook latches on it, mm-hmm. the, kind of like an eye hook and a latch. And then the door would only open as far as the latch would allow. <laughs> And you would hear scratching and and tapping on the other side. Oh wow! <laughs> so <laughs> scared the hell out of us. Wow! Did, um, did you ever witness it come open? Oh, all the time. Yeah. Oh, so, we, so you we, actually we, saw it, like physically saw it open. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. I mean that that's what I mean. My mother installed that because the door would fly open and hit the other, hit the wall before closing. Right. Yeah. I didn't Enough. know if you were just hearing it open and then seeing it. You know, the result of it being open, or if you actually saw it come open. Yeah, sometimes it would fly open violently, and sometimes it would like creak open. You know, mm-hmm. like the la- the the handle would open, and the, and it would just kind of slide. You know, slowly creak, but other times it would fly violently. Mm-hmm. And that was the more convincing because if it was gonna fly violently, you'd see who it was ever was on the other side like kicking the door. But you know, nobody ever was there. Right. It was me and my brother in the house, and three of my cousins over every day. And my mother kind of watched them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so a lot of kids in the house. How old? But, uh, roughly, like mean, age uh, ranges, you know, between. We we were all within two years of each other. So, so around what age? Um. Okay. So I had t- twelve, thirteen. Okay. And uh, my brother and my younger cousin would have been closer to ten or eleven. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it went on for three or four years. So. <laughs> right. So it's that pre pubescent pubescent kind of time where. Uh, things, yeah, things are liminal anyway for kids, and then uh, yeah, the, the poltergeist activity tends to spring up at certain times, you know, around kids of certain ages. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Yep. And by by that time, I was I was starting to watch a lot of the shows, the like Unsolved Mysteries and uh, Sightings and the X Files was just starting around that time, I guess. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, reading all the books, so I was I was um, reading whatever spooky book story i could get my hands on learning about poltergeist and stuff so i, I kind of realized that what was going on at that time it got progressively more intense from there the, there's so many different poltergeist events that happened that it's hard to come up with with the most impressive ones but i, I think the most impressive one uh, as far as something moving was a heavy nightstand that was next to the bed that I think my mother built out of wood. And it was full of like comic books and baseball cards and weird stuff, little books and stuff. And it was heavy, heavy as hell. And I was leaving the bedroom and my cousin was right behind me and I turned to say something to her. And, uh, this nightstand was in midair turned 90 degrees on its side, about two and a half feet off the ground. Wow. So when I turned to look at her, I saw that, and the second I saw it, it you know stopped defying gravity and fell. <laughs> wow! So it was like just long enough for me to notice that the thing was levitating, and then it crashed. You oh, know, wow. and um, that caused my mother to come running up the stairs and yell at us for making a mess. Right, uh, of course. 
<laughs> we got in a lot of trouble on account of the poltergeist. <laughs> <laughs> that was probably like, as far as physical impossibility goes, that was one of the most uh, impressive ones. Yeah, I guess you could say. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, too numerous to count with all the other stuff that would happen there. And uh, did you move or did it cease eventually? It sort well, it just kind of tapered off. Mm-hmm. My family did move and uh, stuff still happens at the house that my parents live in now. And the activity sort of followed me everywhere I went. So... Um, play, different places I've worked, I've had poltergeist activity happen in my presence. Interesting. Very uh, interesting. Different places I've lived, yeah. But I think some of those places also have something else going on. So I'm kind of torn between poltergeist, like the classic poltergeist, or you know the William G. Roll recurring spontaneous uh, psychokinesis thing, mm-hmm. where maybe it's me walking around doing it with my own mind, you know? Right, or maybe you just have to get it into the right place, and it's that combination of person and place. Yeah, yeah. Every puppy is a perfect puppy. But if you want to have the perfect relationship with your puppy, 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy can help you They have a relationship-based approach that helps you and your puppy become perfect for each other. In 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy can help you with online sources, video lessons, a Facebook group where you can interact with other puppy owners, and one-on-one options are available as well. You can find them at sithappens.us. Look for the 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy link at the top of the page. Wouldn't it be awesome if they had a puppy graduation ceremony and we could watch puppies <laughs> in graduation caps? That, oh, that would be pretty awesome. Wouldn't that be amazing yes. to have them just parading by in graduation caps? Yes, I think... I would watch that, and I, we don't even have a dog. Tina, you heard it. <laughs> puppy graduation <laughs> videos. Caps and gals, we have requested them. If you and your puppy need help with potty training, fear and nervousness, if your puppy's barking too much or chewing on things it shouldn't be, If you need help with crate training, hyperactivity issues, leash training, and more, 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy can help you. Find them at sithappens.us. Look for the 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy link at the top of the page. So here's a weird thing. I worked at a a convenience store. Uh, around the time I, w- I was in college, I, I got a job at this convenience store, and it Cumberland was a very different. Was it Cumberland Farms? It wasn't Cumberland Farms. I wish. <laughs> 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 I love Cumberland Farms. <laughs> it was actually Honey Farms, um, but it w- that was a bad time in my life because I had actually just um, kind of dropped out of college, and you know, when when you drop out of college. And then start working at Honey Farms. It's it's not a good time in your life. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it was uh, it was pretty depressing a lot of nights, and I was very stressed out with a lot of different things. And the the activity that would happen in that place was just nuts and just annoying too. You know, uh, like uh, this is when a lot of cell phones you needed a card. You had to buy the card to put minutes on your phone. Oh, yeah, yeah. For those things. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we had the tree, the metal tree in the store that had all the cards hanging on it. And, you know, I'd be sitting there reading a book behind the counter because working the night shift and nobody's coming in. And all of a sudden I'd hear this flittering sound and look, and all the cards would just be, like, flying off the hooks hmm. in all different directions. <laughs> and it would just be, you know, I'd find myself kind of talking to whatever was doing it, talking to the other, I guess, and right. saying, like, would you knock it off? Now I got to pick that up. What are you doing? Or I would hear like a popping sound and all the coffee cups that were on a sleeve where they were stacked up mm-hmm. that that would be like popping off the top of the stack and floating down to the ground and leaning, leaning, landing kind of upside down on the floor. Oh, wow. <laughs> so just irritating stuff, you know. And no one else ever around to, to witness it? There, No, other people saw it. Oh, really? Uh, oh, wow. Wow. The guy that would deliver all the uh, all the food, you know, deliver all the stuff to the store, 
it'd bring it off the truck and set it up in there. Mm-hmm. And then he would have to go around to the different racks and scan items, I guess, and just to get an inventory on them. And he was doing that one day. He showed up while it was really busy. And I had a line out the door of soccer moms that were there to buy milk. <laughs> right. And uh, it was one of those days where, you know, the milk freezer or the milk fridge is empty. And these these this line of moms is getting irritated at me because I haven't restocked the fridge. But I can't get out from behind the counter. And now the delivery guy shows up. And I see him scanning stuff over in the in in the uh, aisle and then he stops and i look over at him and he's just dumbfounded looking at this rack and uh the beef jerkies are very slowly like taking their time going to the end of the hook and jumping off (laughs) (laughs) so it's just that one hook with the jerky like hanging from it through the little hole in the packaging and one by one they're just you know slowly moving to the end and popping off and jumping to the floor oh wow i wouldn't have even noticed but this guy's looking at it with a slack jawed and mm-hmm. mystified and then he looks over at me and i said yeah don't worry about that that happens all the time huh. <laughs> and nobody in line seemed to notice it the guy like ducked out of the store and we had a different delivery guy after that <laughs> i think he took a different route <laughs> <laughs> but um the reason i bring it up is because years later i went in that same store with my girlfriend uh just to buy a pack of smokes or something and uh, we had just come from being out to eat, and I was just kind of giddy and having having a laugh, and I decided to ask the cashier there, have you ever seen anything weird in the store? You know, Because I had just told my girlfriend about the weird stuff that happened when I worked there. Mm-hmm. And um, the kid with it behind the counter, without skipping a beat, said, oh, you mean the slush puppy ghost? <laughs> and I was like, slush puppy ghost. He's like, yeah, over by the uh, slushy machine over there, the, cu- the cups are always just like popping out and landing upside down on the floor. <laughs> oh, wow. Huh. So I was like, well, I guess it wasn't just me. There's something else about the, the store. Yeah. It's very strange, you know? So the reason yeah. I asked about Cumberland Farms, I don't know if I've talked about it on the show before, but they're... The- Cumberland Farms, and particularly the Cumberland Farms in Athol, Massachusetts, is a recurring theme in Strange Familiars. I, I had a friend who actually worked there, and uh, a, a number of people, listeners, have contacted me from Athol or live in Athol. You know, I have a, a listener that lives in Athol, and uh, people are very familiar with this Cumberland Farms in Athol, where, where my friend worked. It's a very bizarre kind of... Oh, I've been there before. Uh, I, sh- I showed up there dressed as the, as the Riddler once. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, at, at the Cumberland Farms in Athol? Yeah, yep. The one in town? Yeah. Oh, I mean, well. it's, one of the, it's one of the only places to go in Athol. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> wow. Oh, so here we go again. Wow. Right. What, no. you, you happen to be dressed as a Riddler and you showed up there? You purposely showed up there dressed as a Riddler? Okay, well, my son lives with his mother in Vermont. Mm-hmm. So when I go to get him on the weekends... And so we have we used to always pass through Athol anyway. We okay. would take Route Two all the way from Worcester to I ninety one in Greenfield, and then head north into Vermont. So Athol was along the way, and we had stopped. We stopped there quite randomly one night just because we needed gas. And I always stop at Cumberland Farms if I can because I have coffee for one dollar. Mm-hmm. I'm a total caffeine freak, so. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a deal you can't beat but yeah my son's school had a has an annual halloween party so my girlfriend and i dressed as the riddler and catwoman gotcha and we showed up there in costume yeah <laughs> do you remember what, what year this was by any chance oh this was fairly recently it oh, was okay. like three years ago probably okay. All right. but um uh, i gotta tell you my cumberland farms joke then okay yeah because you're familiar with Cumberland Farms. I don't even know if they have those outside of Massachusetts. Do I they don't. In New England? The, I know they have them in Maine and New Hampshire, but I don't know if they have them south of New England. No, I've never seen them. You know, so my friend, uh, like I said, he worked there. He lived in a cabin. Uh, West Royalston? R- Royalston, I think. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, he, you know, so I'm familiar with it because of him. Although, in a, another weird coincidence, there's a little pizza shop here that for some reason... Uh, when you got a to-go drink, it would say Cumberland Farms. <laughs> Weird. So they got a bunch of Cumberland Farms cups somehow. So uh, th- I don't know how that happened. But in any case, uh, yeah, I'm familiar with it only you know, through uh, my friend who worked there and, and my visits to him. 
Well, yeah, this might be fun because I like to bring this up. I don't know if it's as interesting to other people as it is to me, but living in Massachusetts, we have so many weird town names that if you're not from here, you would have no idea how to pronounce it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, like I, <laughs> like I'm from Worcester. Right. You know, that's but, not the way it's spelled. <laughs> right. Most people would say Worcester. Right. You know, yeah, exactly. But it's Worcester. And we mm-hmm. pronounce it more like the English do because mm-hmm. they're all English names. That's a reason we call it New England, you right. know. So I don't know if you ever had the chance to go to the town of Barrie. Um, not too far from Athol. But uh, um, is it Barrie, Massachusetts or Barrie? Yeah. Barry, Massachusetts. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't know. If 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 so, I'm. I don't remember. Okay, so it's B A R B A R R E. Okay. Okay. So um, you have that in Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. right? How's mm-hmm. it pronounced there? It's it's Wilkes Bar. Wilkes Bar, right? Because mm-hmm. that makes sense. But I live in Massachusetts, where <laughs> <laughs> we don't make sense. So that's the that's the essence of the joke there. So two men are driving through the town and. One man sees a sign and says, welcome to bar. And uh, he goes, ah, welcome to bar. And he goes, bar is a wonderful town. I love bar. You ever hung out much in bar? And the passenger is starting to get annoyed because he knows, he knows damn well it's pronounced Barry. Mm-hmm. And uh, he decides to keep his mouth shut because he doesn't want to embarrass his friend. But then his friend goes on about the history of bar and won't stop talking about bar and seems to think he knows everything about the town of bar, even though he clearly knows nothing. And finally, the passenger just says, Will you stop it? I know you're. I know you're full of crap. You don't know what you're talking about. It's not called Bar. The name of the town is Barry. Anyone that's ever been here before knows it's called Barry. It's not Bar. And the driver argues, "Well, of course it's Bar. How else? Why would you pronounce it Barry? It's B A R R E. Bar. No, it's Barry. And they back and forth. Barry. Bar. Barry. Bar. He goes, "Pull over. We're going to this gas station. And I'll ask him. Uh, I'll ask them." So the guy walks in. Both of them walk in. They walk right up to the counter. The passenger says. Excuse me, miss. Can you tell my idiot friend where we are? And the woman says, Cumberland Farms. (laughs) (laughs) It's a perfect (laughs) non-joke. I think Cumberland Farms, and particularly Cumberland Farms Athol, needs to drop uh, some sponsorships here at Strange Familiars. They keep coming up. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Well, you know, if that happens... Hopefully they can cut me in on some gift cards because I... <laughs> <laughs> it won't do us any good down here, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I I think I brought up Athol in one of the emails I sent you because, like I said, that is along that trip that I make every week, you know. Gotcha. Yeah, and I did have kind of a UFO sighting out that way. Okay, that... so so you were one of so two or three people have brought it up, and, and you were one of them. Okay, that makes more sense then. Yes. Yep, it's in the email thread somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, because I remember uh, I remember you mentioning having been there before on the podcast. So gotcha. I had, okay, I had to bring it up. But um, if you're on route two and you're coming back toward Worcester, there's there's a rest stop that is very very easy to miss because it's just a live parking area there's no facility there or anything but it's just this little pull off where you can park i think you're not even really supposed to shut your engine up off it's just the kind of place where you can rest your eyes for a minute if you've been driving for a long time mm-hmm. and i used to stop there all the time just to get out and have a smoke because i don't smoke in the car especially you know with my son in the vehicle so uh I had driven all the way to Vermont, dropped him off, I was driving all the way back. And when I get to that point, and I believe it's it's actually Gardner, but it's close to the Athol area. It's about 45 minutes until I'm home, so it's kind of like that's that's the last leg of the journey where I can get out and stretch for a minute. And I got out in this area, and um, I was listening to a podcast and had the window down and could hear the podcast clearly as I was smoking and looking up at the sky. And I see this little dot coming across the sky, like a red dot. And, uh, it's kind of thing that could have been like a satellite or something, or it could have been a plane that was really high up. And, you know, I didn't think much of it. And I kind of, I think even said out loud to myself, just kind of, well, it's not like it's doing anything crazy, you know, Mm -hmm. it's just a little dot. You know, I'm like, maybe if it made like a 45 degree turn without slowing down, you know, and uh, that's exactly what it did. (laughs) (laughs) Like this light was just moving across the sky and then it just 
uh, on a dime turned 45 or like a like a 90 degree turn so a perfect l shape almost you know? as if it heard you you know oh yeah almost like it was responding to what i was thinking you mm-hmm. know what you're saying so it was kind of crazy but then it proceeded to just dance around in the sky you know oh, yeah. so it was doing like figure eights um the way it moved kind of reminded me of uh if you ever seen like a silverfish mm-hmm. the the little bugs the, the, if they come out from under your counter or something they move around in these weird gliding ways yeah yeah uh, that's what it reminded me of and it was up there for like quite a while just watching this thing and then the podcast I was listening to flipped over to an old episode of Welcome Welcome to Night Vale that I was listening to. Let's see, I had the quote written down somewhere, but the the way it starts off is, I don't know, are you familiar with that podcast? I am not. I think that's one of the ones Soraya has been trying to get me to listen to, but uh, while oh, I've it, been writing this book, I have not had time to take on anything else. That that makes sense. Yeah, it's a well, it's it's a comedy podcast that's very like lovecraft inspired so <laughs> very spooky but yeah the the opening line in it was just like red light blinking in the sky the future is unclear or or the future is changing no i don't remember the entire line but but it started off with red light blinking in the sky <laughs> and i was just kind of like blown away by that that kind of coincidence there mm-hmm. i couldn't really rationalize what the light actually was though and when i left it's like i've driven that route a million times and when i came back the next week i had my son with me and i told him about it so we went out and looked and it was there again oh wow (laughs) and it was there like every time we went for a while and eventually they set up new lights in that parking lot and there was so much light pollution you couldn't see anything in the sky Mm -hmm. during that time i also saw the thing up in vermont like it was just pacing me and following me around <laughs> same light but yeah it's mm-hmm. acting the same way and i pointed it out to this time like my friends or my son's friend's mom who just happened to be there and she said oh yeah that's weird you know mm-hmm. but then just shook it off but i'm like not really sure what it could have been like a drone maybe but it was february and about you know negative 10 degrees fahrenheit out <laughs> right. and kind of windy the first time i saw it and i mean there are airports nearby there and there is a blinking tower not far from that rest stop with a red light but the light that i saw never blinked it stayed red the whole time it just mm-hmm. moved around in the sky and um did seem to respond to what i was thinking and i don't know i don't really never could figure out what to do with that Except, you know, just accept it as something that I saw. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's kind of weird. And not far from there is, is an area that's referred to as Monsterland, uh, where there's supposed to have been a lot of Bigfoot sightings and a lot of red orbs that seem to have something to do with the Bigfoot stuff. Oh, really? Stuff. Yeah. Yeah, the the guy that wrote the book about it and called it Monsterland. Uh, the area is Lemonster State Forest, but the guy that wrote the book is uh, Ronnie Le- Ronnie LeBlanc, and he's on that Expedition Bigfoot show now. Oh, okay. But, okay. Yeah, yeah, I met him briefly at the Lemonster UFO conference, but and uh, I saw his presentation up in Exeter. But yeah, I mean, prior to that, I I had never heard of that kind of stuff in Lemonster. Having grown up in Worcester, that's only about twenty miles north. And I had never heard of Bigfoots up there, but <laughs> I guess I guess that's you know he has a lot of cases that he's recorded and things that he's seen, and that red dot that I saw was not too far from there. So yeah, I'm mean, we you kind of ha- once you tune in, I think then things start becoming more visible to you in a sense. I didn't, I had no clue there were so many Bigfoot sightings around my area until I started writing the books on it and really digging. And then it's like all of a sudden they're just popping up left and right, and it's like, oh, okay. So yeah, yeah. And it's weird because it's like they were there the whole time, clearly. Right? They, yeah, they exactly. Ate you, and then <laughs> yeah, and it's not like I wasn't interested in that as a kid or anything. You know, I've I've you know been interested in it more or less my entire life, but it only really after I started digging in did I start you know becoming aware of just how many there were. Right. Right. Yeah, and it seems like 
I've been adjacent to a lot of this stuff since obviously I was very young. So I, I don't know what that says about me. If some people just attract the stuff more or are just more open to seeing it, you know? <laughs> yeah. But. I, you know, I think some people might just be like, I was on uh where did the road go recently? We were talking about Chad and uh, some people like Chad might just be antennas for, for this kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and prior to, you know, uh, before the last year or two where I really started reaching out to different people in, in different communities to, um, you know, I, I guess I call myself more of an amateur researcher now because I, <laughs> I try to write about the stuff and research what I can. And uh, um, Secret, they're all amateurs. Some are just better well, than others. I just try to try to be more upfront about it. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, I, I I'm humble to a fault in well, that no, respect. That's, but that's, that's fine. That's fine. yeah. But yeah, sharing my stories in in the in the past two years with various different people didn't occur to me that I had so many until I started sharing them because mm-hmm. I was, uh, and then beyond that, I started realizing you know there's been plenty of people that if they told me a, a whole string of stories ranging from ghosts to UFOs to, you know, magical stuff, I would probably think they were crazy, you know, mm-hmm. or or putting me on, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I kind of worried about that. And especially, you know, the story I told about the two lights at the end of the bed and the premonition. I mean, it, it, I, I don't think that many people have that clear memories when they were kids that ends with them going to sleep, you know, mm-hmm. or at least I didn't before, you know, mm-hmm. I, I was always kind of dubious about stories that people would tell, you know, I was, I was three or four and I was in bed and I was like, how do you remember three or four in bed? How, how, how are you not, how are you not sure that that was just an extreme dream, you know? Right. right. <laughs> but, you know. Well, here I am telling the same kind of story and a bunch more besides. <laughs> yeah. So I guess I can't judge, but I guess my answer like to someone who would say that is it doesn't necessarily matter because that would have been, you know, like a, a quote unquote big dream anyway. So it, even if it was quote unquote just a dream, I would say it's still meaningful and still important. But, yeah, and again, like I said before, I think the only thing that made it stick with me was was the fact that it seemed to be some kind of premonition, you mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm. Yeah. of something fairly insignificant, like just a birthday party, but something I'd remember, you know. Right. <laughs> so I guess it served its purpose in in making me remember the story, you know. And I think too, even probably even you know within the first half year of, of starting Strange Familiars, if you would have asked me about people with you know, lifetimes of experiences and multiple experiences like that, I would have been like, yeah, I don't know as well. But the longer I do this, I don't know if I want to say it's more common than not for people to have multiple experiences, but it's certainly very common for people to have multiple experiences and with multiple different things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, uh, I've met a fair amount of people that, you know, it's um, one of my friends just calls it like the weird shit. <laughs> <laughs> like you know weird with the uh with a y right right um and, and some of us just have it i think it's available and, to everyone i think some people might might just be you know I, I, again i was talking with sarai about this just the other night and, and i think it's, it's like artwork for some people you know, like some people are just more naturally talented as an artist and and other people have to develop the skill or, or music. You know, some people right. just can pick up any instrument and play it. And other people have to practice, practice, practice. I think well, it may be more like that. Yeah. And I mean, there's others that would say that's its own form of magic, too. True. Absolutely. Uh, speaking of which, have you gotten any stories told to you about uh, Wilderness Geist and the effects it has? Uh, people are starting to tell me stories now. It took a long time. At first, I was kind of like, oh, I guess this, like, because I asked people to please tell me if anything happened. And oh, really? Then, <laughs> and it, it took a little while, and now stories are starting to come in, and I'm, they're coming in different places. That's the only problem, because some people write the podcast, some people write the band, you know, via Bandcamp, some people write me on Facebook, and I have not done a good job of compiling them, because they're coming in in all these different places. But yeah, they are starting to come in. Why do you have one? I only bring it up because uh, a couple other people, like right after that released and people started getting their copies, I, uh, people started mentioning to me like, wow, crazy shit 
happens when you put on wilderness guys wow. yeah, <laughs> like be the, careful I, when you put this on you know like the whole atmosphere of the house changes every time i put it on you know wow and, uh, and i you know i've i've listened to it while driving mm-hmm. which um one of my friends didn't recommend <laughs> <laughs> And she just said, like, okay, just make sure that, you know, the weather is okay so you don't drive off the road at any point, you know? Because, um, yeah, one of my friends also told me that I think she had, like, floating orbs come into the car or something while she was driving listening to it. Oh, wow. It was just a very strange thing. Yeah, I've, but, I've had, um, while I'm getting ready to interview someone, they actually have audio of a bunch of, um, they were in Salem, actually, and uh, they played it. <laughs> at a haunted hotel and then got the bunch... hawthorne i'm not sure it may have been it may have been i'm not sure but they said they got a bunch of uh evps and stuff afterwards and you know they said they're just going through the audio and then they'll come on the show and talk about it so that nice. that'll be somebody coming on to talk about and I've, <laughs> I've gotten a few other different accounts i have a friend who's just bugging the heck out of me to do it uh in hex hollow in that grove of trees where i found the groundhog he- head and i just yeah. don't know if i want to do it there or not <laughs> like yeah. when you playing with fire yeah well i definitely wanted to bring it up to you because i didn't know if anybody had told you personally but yeah i mean i've heard a couple of reports of <laughs> yeah i've, I've got yeah. so just wanted you, you to know you created something real special there <laughs> oh, I, that's i'm honored to hear it and, and thrilled i mean that's that was kind of the purpose uh, that was the intention, and it, like I said, it took a long time, maybe even almost a year before I got like one or two stories, and I think I got maybe like, uh, maybe in the first couple months, maybe one person said, oh, you know, something weird happened. It wasn't anything, you know, super exciting or, or dramatic or anything, but then uh, then they started to come in, at, you know, at about a year, and then after it was used in Hellier, I don't know whether it's just more people are listening to it after that or if it has something to do with the Hellier connection. But oh, since yeah. then, I've gotten, you know, four or five different stories at least. Right. Both the people that were telling me about it got it as a result of Hellier. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, Hellier had its own effect on a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think it may be that it's just opening people's eyes. I, I don't know to this stuff, but I think in a way Hellier is kind of almost like a paranormal virus in a sense. It's really kind of affected a lot of people in very interesting ways. It really has. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. A lot of the people I've, I've gotten to know over the last couple of years are almost a direct result of Hellier. (laughs) Oh, wow. (laughs) Just talking to people on the internet about it, you know, Yeah. and people I've become pretty close with. So I don't know why I can't get Greg on the show. I mean, there's, it's, no real reason other than I think our schedules just haven't matched up, but uh, right. the like the stuff with the mylar balloons that happened in pandemonium with us. Oh right, yeah, I knew, I forgot but, about that. So I didn't know that Wilderness Guys was going to be in Hell Year Two until maybe maybe a month before it came out. I think Greg contacted me and, and asked me if it was okay, and of course I said yes. So. I didn't know anything and I didn't have any inside information about what was going on. He said it was going to be used, you know, as a soundtrack for a ritual in the show. I said, fantastic. That's great. So I didn't know anything else about the show other than that. There was a ritual and wilderness guys would be using it. So I didn't know mylar balloons would play a part in Hellier at all. So this, you know, of course, pandemonium came out before Hellier too. So that's all complete coincidence that there's mylar balloon stuff in both, in both of those. And I really wanted to like you know uh, touch base with Greg on that stuff because I don't I'm pretty sure he hasn't heard the Pandemonium episodes, but I want to you know run down that stuff with him. It was pretty wild. Right, right, yeah. And I actually, um, I met you and Greg on the same day at, at that X Filers conference oh, that's in right. Rhode Island. You, were, you, were, you told me you were at X Filers. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. I bought I, I bought a copy of Don't Look Behind You and got a got a autograph. Awesome. Well, thank <laughs> so. you. That that was a fan. I mean, it was not super well attended, but as far as everything else, that conference was amazing. Like, the, yeah, I mean, the I was there on. Yeah, I was there on the Friday of that conference, and um, yeah, it was a killer lineup, <laughs> and, not, and not a ton of people there, but that kind of worked out for me because I got a chance to actually talk to people. But yeah, it, yeah, no, that was a great time. I I had hoped to be able to talk to you a little bit more, and. uh 
and Josh, but you guys were kind of busy talking to each other a lot, and I didn't want to interrupt. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew you guys were working on the book, so it was kind of, and you probably don't get together in person too often. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, but uh, but yeah, that was um your your Pennsylvania gorilla sightings, the gorilla flap presentation. I was oh, there yeah. for that. Yeah, I think yeah. I ended up doing like because they wanted me to talk for two hours or something, so I ended up doing it like every presentation. I think in my in my uh, canon there, and then yeah. taking <laughs> questions besides. So it was, you know, because I just I, yeah, that's a, my biggest problem at these conventions is is hitting the time. I'm either going over or under. I can't. I cannot seem to get my uh, talks to to uh, be the right time. So. Yeah, well, you just you know, bring your banjo, and uh, <laughs> if you run out of time, just play a few tunes. <laughs> <laughs> I may in the future. I mean, <laughs> yeah. So you got one more story for us before we, I let you go? I, I got a pretty good one. This was the uh, first one I put on uh, put on the liminal earth thing. Uh, I, I should plug that while I'm oh, here yeah. too. I've yeah, done we should it talk a couple a times bit. recently. We should definitely talk uh, a little bit about uh, liminal earth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Do you have a chance to check out the site at all, or? I know you've been real busy with the book, but I have not. I, yeah, um, I I know what it is, and people have talked to me about it and said, you know, basically like you need to check this out. It's really, really interesting and really good tool. But I have not had a chance to mess with it yet. Yeah, well, um, it, it it is pretty great. It's it's just a you know it's an online interactive tool uh, started by Jeremy Puma and Garrett Kelly out in Seattle, and uh, it's a site where you can just kind of enter in any. Uh, any sighting that you had or any weird experience that you had on the map where you are and and tell your story. So, you know, it's kind of like Google Maps. You can just scan around a map mm-hmm. and there's all these little markers for, for uh, you know, straight up ghosts or cryptids or UFO sightings or thin places, all these uh, different categories that's and stuff. Awesome. That, yeah. It's pretty pretty cool. So they they opened it up to the whole world. Originally, it was just Luminal Seattle. So now it's Luminal Earth. And anywhere you are in the world, you can report what you saw and pin it to the map. So the whole idea is to remythologize the landscape mm-hmm. and bring a little bit of mystery and and mythology and magic back to the the places that, that have become kind of urban and mundane these days. You know? Absolutely. I can get behind that. Right. Yeah, no, it is. It's pretty great. And they opened it up at one point to allow, well, they they took on what they call ambassadors. So there's a bunch of us that just are ambassadors for our region. So they made me the ambassador for Massachusetts, which I'm happy to do. And I get to contribute my own stories as well as other stories that I collect in the area. So it's been pretty great. The uh, deputy director for liminal compliance <laughs> for Massachusetts and environs, so <laughs> liminal compliant. Yeah, they gave me a snazzy title. So, so. What's, what's the URL for that? Oh, it's a uh, liminal dot earth, all lowercase. That'll just bring you right there. And then you can uh, find your location, or you can type in a keyword to search for something, or you can submit your stories there. So awesome. Yep. This one it just kind of defies categorization for me because it's it's not not a ghost or a UFO or you know anything it's a weather weather anomaly if if, if anything but uh, just really strange I was driving to a party at um, at the time I was in a band and the guy that played harmonica in the band uh, was was uh, driving the car and we were heading to the party and we got to this intersection like a few blocks away from where the party was not far at all. And the light was red and we're sitting at a red light next to another car going the same way at the red light and people across the intersection on all sides of the intersection have a red light. It took long enough for the light to change that it started to become uncomfortable. You know, you got a little bit of a creeping sensation, like something was really off about it because Mm -hmm. everybody had a red light. Mm Mm-hmm. So I start looking around, and there's no crosswalk signals. There's no pedestrians. Nothing that would cause the light to stay red that long. And everything is dead quiet. But this is the middle of the city. This is Webster Square in Worcester, Massachusetts. Fairly busy place. It's where the main street crosses, like Park Ave, in this town. And there's businesses around. And there's always people blasting music out of their cars. Always people honking horns. And today it was just quiet. And it was just like a summer day and everybody had their windows down and it had this surreal effect where 
almost felt like kind of like an Oz factor for a city, mm -hmm. which I never really hear about. I always hear about that like in the woods, but it had that kind of, you know, uh, Oz factor feel to it. Right. Like sucks the, the sound out of the. Right. Area. Yeah. Like you're in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we didn't really talk about it much, but except grumbling, maybe like, oh, what the, what the hell's going on, you know? And all of a sudden it got dark, like dark clouds came in from every part of the sky and just formed one black cloud over the intersection. And, um, before we got a chance to say anything about it, there was the loudest clap of thunder I've ever heard and a brilliant white flash of light. And then a loud popping sound that came from around where the gas fill door was on the, on, on his car <laughs> hmm. and uh, like no rain or anything, just this, you know, thunder lightning, simultaneous pop sound outside his car. And then the clouds started to disperse and it was bright and sunny again and the light turned green and we just kept driving. Hmm. <laughs> we showed up at that party and tried to tell people that we got struck by lightning because it was the only thing we could think of. Right. It was almost like a black cloud formed directly above us, struck the car with lightning, and then dispersed and went away and the light turned green. Yeah, so all this uh, happened in, while the light was red. Right. Yeah, yeah, the light stayed red the whole time. I mean, all the the entire incident took less than a minute or two to really happen you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. well, the light was green re, the light was red for everybody long enough that people probably normally you'd see people get irritated and honk a horn or decide they were just going to go on red <laughs> right yeah. or do the thing when i start backing up and going forward right yeah i'm trying to try to trip the sensor or whatever mm -hmm. um but yeah nobody got agitated it was just dead quiet and then this cloud appears strikes us with lightning and then goes away wow and, we go to the party, which is, you know, 500 feet away from that intersection, and nobody there believed us. <laughs> nobody believed us at all, and nobody heard the light, nobody heard the thunder. Um, it was bright and sunny out as far as anybody could see, so um, that that was just a damn weird thing as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's really I don't even know what to call that. Yeah. Do, do, do you have any uh, similar stories I, to that? I, at, so far, I don't think I've gotten anything like that. But, yeah. but I almost guarantee you somebody listening will hear that and say, oh, yeah, that happened to me. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Um, yeah, I've been through William Corliss's Weather Anomaly books and didn't find anything <laughs> similar to it. <laughs> but, yeah, that's the kind of story that we, we that is really good on the Middle Earth because the stories don't necessarily have to be paranormal. They're just very odd occurrences that, right. you know, maybe you never really had a chance to tell anybody. Right. And, uh, uh, that, that's liminal.earth again. Yep. Yep. And there's plenty of great stuff you can check out there. Awesome. And, uh, you can become an ambassador even if you want for your territory. We haven't filled up all the states yet. So. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> so, yeah. AP Strange, thank you so much for t uh, sharing your stories tonight. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me on. I uh, had a lot of fun. We have almost 60 patron shows now. When people sign up, $3 a month, you can get full extra episodes of Strange Familiars. Patreon.com slash Strange Familiars. There are other levels there. You can get things like signed copies of my books, artwork, t-shirts, pins and stickers, and more. Check it all out at Patreon.com slash Strange Familiars. And now there's an option to pay even less than $3 a month. How is that possible? If you sign up for an annual membership, pay for a year you get a 10 percent discount oh no matter what level you go in at so you can get 10 percent off pay for a year up front and get the extra shows for even less and you help us out without our patrons we couldn't make strange familiars we really can't do it without the patrons so thank you all you patrons thank you for your support if you want to help us out and you don't like the idea of a monthly subscription like patreon you can go to the show notes under any episode Look for the paypal.me link where you can make a one-time donation. Everyone can help by sharing the show on social media, by liking and subscribing wherever you're listening, whatever podcatcher you use, and by leaving us those nice five-star reviews, which helps get the show in front of new potential listeners. And I want to thank Jason W. for a PayPal donation. He, again, is a repeat donator. 
He's made several donations via PayPal, so thank you so much, Jason. It's a huge help. We have a witch for the photo of the week. She doesn't look overly spooky. I (laughs) know. She's kind of beautiful. She's just not posed in a stereotypical way. She's Yes, she's not straddling the broom. No. She is kicked back, relaxed. She's not even wearing black. (laughs) But she is on her broom, and she's off to the Sabbath, I suppose, or wherever witches go. This is Miss Gabriel Ray. No this relation to Faye. It's a real photo postcard from 1906 or possibly before. The postmark on the back is 1906. And you found out a little bit about Gabriel Ray, didn't you? When we first started collecting postcards, I collected a lot of like Edwardian era theater actresses. And this is one of the girls that I used to collect quite a bit. She was in a lot of um, stage comedies in her early life and then Ended up spending like close to 40 years in a sanatorium after having a nervous breakdown. Ooh. I mean, the last 40 were not like from like 20 to, to 60. She lived to be 90, so <laughs> she had a good run before that. She died in 1973. So this is a picture for her in 1906. She lived to 1973. Mm-hmm. Miss Gabriel Ray. It's a witch photograph. You can go to the show notes under this episode and see an image of that. You can click on that. It'll take you to our Etsy shop where you can purchase this real photo postcard for $45. Check it out. While you're at our Etsy shop, you can check out all the artwork that's there. It's a big help when you purchase artwork. You get original artwork, and you help us with the show as well. I want to thank everybody who's been buying stuff from our Etsy shop. That's a huge help. That's it for now. We will be back next week with another episode of Strange Familiars. Join us September 25th, 26th, and 27th for a three-day special streaming event, Strange Strange Realities, realities. to push the limits of your reality. Featuring authors, academics, researchers, occultists, experiencers, podcasters, and practitioners. All presenting fresh cutting-edge material and research. Streaming live. Featuring presentations by Brent Reigns, editor of Alternate Perceptions Magazine. Aaron Golias, host of the Saucer Live podcast. David Metcalf, writer and researcher. Alan Greenfield, author of Secret Cipher of the Euphonox. Stephanie Quick, writer and blogger. Red Pill Junkie, 14 researcher and explorer. Tim Banal, host of Banal of America. Guy Malone, iconoclast and troublemaker. Timothy Ritter, host of Strange Familiars. Kiki Dombrowski, author and practitioner. Greg Bishop, author of Project Beta. Ginny Ashford, host of 13 O'Clock. Recluse, host of The Farm. Jack Montgomery, folk magic. Joshua Cutchin, author of Thieves in the Night. Reverend Michael Carter, Alien Contact Experiencer, Dr. Future, host of Future Quick, Tony Kale, author of Memphis Hoodoo, Rin Collier, Occultist, Soraya Ascap, host of Where Did the Road Go, and John Tinney, Ghost Stalkers and Hell. All three days, only $20. Tickets and info available at strangerealitiesconference.com. Brought to you by the Conspiranormal Podcast. Conspiranormal.com. Strange Reality. Strange Familiars is a production of Dark Holler Arts, music, books, art, podcasts, and more. DarkHollerArts.com. Intro and background music is by Stone Breath. Go to StoneBreath.Bandcamp.com for more. We are on Facebook, Facebook.com slash Strange Familiars, where you can join the Strange Familiars Gathering Group. And we are on Instagram, at Strange Familiars. <laughs>
Oh, 